Oh, TikTok. <laughs> <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. <laughs> Welcome to this Monday's Wealth Creation Show. So, Jim, we are going to cover money, wealth creation, and property investment. Now, we reference yep. property investment quite a lot when we do this show. This show about wealth creation isn't predominantly about wealth creation or about property investment, but that's what we refer to because it's what obviously the field that we're involved in, and that is quite a lucrative way of creating wealth. So I thought it's, it's only right that we delve into that a bit deeper. Obviously, you've been in this for 30, how many years, Jim? 33? 30 odd? Aye, too long. Too long, aye. We'll, we'll, we'll too long is the expression I would use. Uh, yeah. Too long. Uh, I'm just trying to, so the apologies, I'm trying to get my TikTok up and running. No, it's fine, you do that and I'll just uh, run through what we're going to cover today. So, what a shame for the TikTokers, they're missing out on this initial this initial uh, uh, and gambit. I, I tell you what, though, if, if you're if you're wanting to if you're wanting to really um, if you're wanting to really make a lot of wealth in 2024 and way beyond there and and into all the different uh, all the different timelines, because wealth creation is a it's a it's a long game. Yeah, I don't I don't think people realise that this is a long game. So on Wednesday in two days' time, I will get another 30 properties. Yeah. to add to my portfolio at a cost of 1.9 million and i defy anybody out there to tell me <laughs> that i'm no you know i'm not doing the right thing here because it's generating an income every single year about fifty thousand yeah. pound net every single year 50 grand yeah. and that's taking into account a lot of overheads because i'm a big you know absorb it all yeah. in so and 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 I'm not putting any money into that at all. By the way, now, I'm not putting any money. That's a hundred percent funded yeah. by Shawbrook Bank, and the numbers work fifty grand a year in profit. Now, anybody tuning in or anybody listening, in, I defy you to tell me that this doesn't work yeah. in terms of property investment. Of course, it works every single time for the people that work it. Be proactive. Remember, begin with the end in mind. Yeah. And then work your plan towards it. Yeah, I mean, that's something that you, you always stress. Uh, and whatever you do, I think start with the end and then work out how you're going to get there. Get there. I think that um, we've picked actually probably a good time to cover this because, as you say, you're just waiting on this. Uh, Finalising on Wednesday and we're going to take over these other 30. And, and the journey to, to get to where you are to be able to do to add another 30 and a winner like that. Um, so it's maybe a good time that we chose to uh, speak about property investment as it, a, as... it took me about God, it took, when i when i added 30 uh, it probably took me about uh, i think possibly six or seven years to add my first 30 to do the first lot yeah uh, yeah my first 30 six or seven years and i was going hell for leather mm -hmm. and now that's in less than a year i've added 30. that's yeah. pretty good yeah because i think it was at 2020 and and you set out your goal and your goal and you thought right i'm going to do another um 20 and we've done 20. Yeah, and then I went, what am I doing? You idiot. You're going to do another 50. Yeah. Aim high. Aim high. Cool. And so that's what I came back to you. This is crazy. It has yeah. to be another 50 I'm going for. If I say 20, I'll probably hit 20 and go, well, I missed opportunities for the other lot. And and because I knew I had the money for it, but I missed yeah. opportunities for the other lot because purely because the fact that it didn't, it didn't, I didn't think it was 30, it, there was 50 out there to get. But then, but then I read, oh God, what did I read? I can't remember the book I was reading. It was maybe Richard Branson. It was maybe Stephen Covey. It was maybe something else. It was, you know, some one of these books and went, whoa, wait a minute. Uh, you, your goal should be huge. Uh, it frightens yeah. you. And I thought, God, I'd add another 50 properties in the next couple of years. Or even yeah, in, the, in me, the next year. <laughs> add another 50 properties. <laughs> I know it frightens you. You're the one that's got to manage them. Um, <laughs> I add another 50 properties in a year. It's like, wow, how, how is that entirely possible? Um, but I tell you what, less than two years we did it. Yep. So what does yeah. that say then? Yeah, I think I think it's, it really demonstrates that, yes, when you set goals or, or set, set out to do what your, your end goal is, um, aim back because you'll surprise yourself, I think. I think in anything you do. But like I, as I say, we're, we're referring to property investment in particular today. And I think in today's kind of dynamic world and things, people do have that pursuit of financial stability and wealth creation has become a common aspiration for a lot of people and people who are watching yep. obviously I would imagine are in the same boat and hence the reason they have landed on uh, the show and probably follow the show 
um, or if you're if you're watching for the first time, uh, you've caught us on a good show to to pick up on. So it's all right, uh, we've got the TikTokers now; they're online. Uh, okay. <laughs> One avenue that has consistently proven to be lucrative is, of course, property investment, and it really um, it really incorporates both rental income and and also capital appreciation as well. I know, Jim, for you. Capital appreciation obviously is important. It's not the it's not the main thing for you. It's uh, longevity and cash flow and and reinvesting mm. in your stock and and you know and we'll cover all that today and um and a wee bit more detail. But as a seasoned property investor and indeed an agent yourself, yeah. uh, with a wealth of experience and as I say thirty probably thirty plus years, um you do understand the significance of these elements and building a successful investment portfolio. So yep. today, that's what we're going to explore and how they, these two intertwining concepts of, of money, uh, wealth creation and property investment um, really, and we'll go through the opportunities and showcase how they present for individuals seeking ultimately financial security and independence. Because mm -hmm. that's ultimately what people will be setting out. To do I see it every not... single time, Richard. Uh, most more and more people. I mean, look at for example the Scottish Property uh, Network that I, yeah. I admin for. I mean, the amount of people actually coming to the Scottish Property Network now um, on Facebook, the group that we've got, it's it's gone up to five five thousand three hundred, but it's gone up about two hundred in the last couple of weeks. And um, more and more people. This is this is coming back to the scenario of uh, the government actually saying, or the pension companies actually saying, well, actually you're going to have to earn. At least thirty-one thousand of a pension every single year to actually yeah. have a have a have a an an adequate lifestyle. Sorry, for an, just an adequate it's lifestyle. Adequate. No, You're having a laugh. Thirty-one thousand. You've got to have thirty-one thousand every single year. You've got to have at least half a million in your pension mm -hmm. to get that. Which is quite a lot. Most people have got no chance. Most people my age have got no chance. They will work until they die. Yeah. Why are you working until you theory, die? Theory like, yeah. I mean, I'll, I'll, work in, I'll work until I die, to be honest. Sweet but choice. I love what I do. I do yeah. it every single day and I get to do the best job in the world. I get to do what I want to do when I want to do it. And things like this as well, what we're doing right now. So I love what I do. So yeah. it's never like work when you love what you do. But for most people, 91% of the population hate their job. Yeah. 91%. That's yeah, a day that's day the people people that are You've stuck got in to a do it job got to do it paycheck to paycheck and, and you'll yeah. have to do your job for the rest of your days until literally the day you can't do it anymore what a future to look forward to that's not great and and this is why we talk about wealth creation all the time this is why we talk about property investment this is why we talk about money yes about money because it's yeah. not money for money's sake it's what money can do for you try living without it it's right up there with oxygen yeah definitely right up there with oxygen yeah, you I need think... money to do anything you try and go into a shop and say i tell you what i'm just going to take that for free uh no <laughs> you're not getting that for free you you ask somebody to do something for you go and build that wall for me i don't want to pay for it oh wait a minute no no no, no. you'll need money to do that yeah but as some people say, oh, money is the root of all evil. Well, it's not. Let me just correct you on that. Money, money is not the root of all evil. It's the love of money. It's yeah. the root of all evil. So get your facts right when you reel that off. It's so, the love of the money. It's not money itself. Money does good things in the hands of people that are really, you know, are, 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 are givers. That's yeah. what I would say. So money does good things in the hands of the right people, definitely. And that's what it's there for. So yeah. what we talk about in this, and property investment is obviously the one that I pinned my covers to the mast with, and it works every single time, way before anybody else had started in this. Simon Zushi, way before Kiyosaki probably even started. I think Kiyosaki started about the same time as me. You know, I mean, we, he's a good guy. Uh, yeah. Yeah, but he sold courses, and that's where he made all yeah. his money. I did it a different way. I, 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 I built property first as a result of doing it alongside my income, and I'm fine with that. But he did something completely different, and that that's fine as well. But way before all that happened, you know, I trod a path. I I basically cut down a jungle and worked my way through it with a machete 
my metaphoric machete, you know, cutting through and making, you know, getting that, getting that streamline and building yeah. that highway as a go in, in order to, okay, what do I need to do next time I do the same thing again? How can I get a property through faster? How can I get through quicker? How can I get that finance through quicker? How can I get that property purchase quicker? How can I get, how can I get all these things to work in tandem or in synergistic? So we'll actually get the huge super effect of effectively a super highway to financial freedom. Yeah. And this is what we talk about, and I talk about every single time, about the financial freedom blueprint. And what we teach to people in investors' workshops. Now, the, that happens every single month. You do that. And it's like, wait a minute, wait, Richard, you're doing this for free. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> but people actually look at it for free and think it's not worth anything because it's free. So if you want, I'll start charging you for it. <laughs> but I tell yeah, you no. what, I'm quite happy just to deliver it for free because I've got no, you know, I would I would hope that other people would learn from this and actually build wealth as well. But give some of it to the people that can't help themselves. Give some of it to the people that are more vulnerable in society as a result. There's only so much you can make. And the rest is just for show. Yeah. And if you're a show person, you're probably not going to last in this. You're probably not going to go the distance. You'll probably bail out at some point in time because as the as, as it gets tough, you tend just to go, well, why am I doing it now? I've got everything I want. When you get that Ferrari or you get that McLaren, I was looking at McLaren's 720s last night, the McLaren 720S Spider, and it's like, whoa, 225,000. I thought, nah, did it be daft, Jim? Mm-hmm. I, didn't, I don't know why I was looking at them. I, I think it was somebody else was driving in them. It was a show I saw, something online, and I saw, and this guy turned up in a McLaren 720S, and I thought, God, that was a great car, eh? And, uh, but, but I'll, I'll never get to that point where I'll actually buy one. I'll probably hire one and run about in it for a few weeks and then hand it back, and that will save me an absolute fortune. Well, it's certainly, it's yeah, certainly a lot more than taking it from a garage, you know, and yeah. putting off the forecourt and losing the money straight away as soon as you drive out. But oh, yeah, some, well, of these, some people justify it by saying, well, it's an investment. My car, my car appreciates in value definitely. because I've got a limited edition. And, you know, fair enough. That's entirely up to yourself. That's what you want to do. That's what you really feel that you can invest in as, as, as cars. But it's no for me. I mean, houses for me are bricks and mortar. They're not going to disappear. People are always going to want them. There's always somebody for somebody to live with, uh, to live in. And uh, and I feel, a bit, I feel a bit motivated to the fact that I put people's roo- uh, roof over people's head. Um, and some of the people that are most vulnerable in society, that's kind of what kind of what I get at. It's, I, I always, I, I mean, I know people go, oh, that's very, that's very generous of you. That's very, it's very giver of you. But but when you do things like that, it's a bit selfish because it's like you get that, you get that feeling, you get that good feeling that you get as a result of that, the payoff. You know, you get that aspirational feeling that the fact that you're doing something good for someone else. So, you know, you, you, we all get, you know, both parties get a win-win situation in that in that in, in that scenario. Um, so so that's why I, that's why I do what I do. Yeah. Well, I think a good place really to start, and you've you've covered a wee bit already, is money. And a lot of people don't like to talk about money, but as ultimately, if you're trying to build and create wealth, then it really is the foundation of that. And it serves as kind of it's the lifeblood of wealth creation. And really, if you don't like talking about money or shy away from money then you're going to need to change that because i don't watch this show you're on the wrong show <laughs> if, if you know if you if, if, if money if money to use the root of all evil then you're 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 on the wrong show you're yeah. actually listening to the wrong podcast completely because you've not accepted the fact that we live in a capitalistic system and that is just the way it runs and, and you're either going to have to you're you're not going to change it don't kid yourself if you're out there you will never change it it's like drinking poison and expecting the other person to die, trying to change that system. Yeah, it's like it's here to stay. Everybody refers to it, and the whole the whole thing's geared round that capitalistic system. Um, and if you try to change it, the whole system will fall apart and chaos will reign. So that's why, and no one will let you change it anyway, because the people in power are actually they're basically they're basically on the gravy train. You know, they're no one pushed off the gravy train, so they don't want to change it either. And that's your politicians. Yeah, I think there's a wee, there's a lot of misconceptions with money and people's attitude towards money. But I think really you need to be quite clear on the fact that money provides you the means in order to invest, reinvest, 
to be able to seize opportunities to do things and then ultimately yeah. to generate that passive income which then like i say ultimately allows you to reinvest and and i think that's it's really crucial to understand that wealth creation it's not solely about accumulating a lot of money but mm -hmm. rather utilizing it wisely and you, you you've already run through a few examples of that Gemma, about what you actually do with your money is so important it's just not about amassing lots of money and and having it all sitting do you know what i mean like you said you've got the rest is just for show but so you yeah. and, and if you have got lots extra for show then maybe think about giving it to other people that don't why are you smiling <laughs> i'm smiling to myself because uh, ben <laughs> and uh, uh, elaine my wife they're yeah. they're in they're playing monopoly go just now and they're right. obviously collecting cards and they were sitting with each other last night and saying oh i've got these cards and i've got these cards and it's online monopoly go so you can yeah. play it as monopoly itself <laughs> <laughs> and ben uh, ben went and what you got to say i went well i play monopoly for real don't i <laughs> and, but uh, but anyway i can't you would say that <laughs> i knew you would say that i says well why would you want to play it on a game if you can play monopoly for real it's like that's you know yeah. that's effectively what I, that i loved monopoly i mean monopoly is what i grew up with and that, that was the first introduction to wealth creation in my mind yeah you know so as a young boy um i used to i i, and I, I used to, a young child i used to play all the time and used to get beat all the time and i used to get annoyed and just go why am i getting beat why am i getting beat this is the early solution you know mm -hmm. the fact that you know what am i need to trailblaze here what am i need to do here in order to work out the system in order to work out how to win monopoly every single time and then i just got to the point where it's like wait a minute you just need to buy as much as possible as soon as possible because at some point in time somebody will land on you and you'll get rent from them uh, but don't get yourself pushed to the fact that you'll push yourself and you'll leverage yourself too high what does that sound like that's the basic principles of property yeah. investment and monopoly monopoly put that in place and that really falls into having a, a really good grasp on financial like literacy and, and and prudent um money management money management's a skill and we spoke about this before and it's something that's not taught in schools it's not part of any curriculum yeah you know money management and being smart with your money and even things like obviously how to th things that should be taught in skill in school like um even just insurance and just things that you just don't learn yeah. and you need to really become wise to that fact or have have a um, mentor that makes you wise to that fact mm -hmm. and helps you pick up on these skills because if you don't have these skills in life then you're probably not going to go very far yeah definitely i don't i don't think you'll go very far either if you don't have financial or literally skills i would recommend that every single person do some sort of basic form of bookkeeping mm -hmm. um, or financial record keeping at, at, at school whether it's at school whether it's at, um, so if, if you're wanting to be if you're wanting to be for example if you want to be a surgeon if you want to be a dentist if you want to be a lawyer if you want to be a, a, a in, in the theater if you want to go in and do a degree in all these different things i would say it should be mandatory that you should do business skills some sort of basic business academic skills which incorporates financial management as well understanding a balance sheet and p and l and profit and loss account income expenditure account is what it's known as as well um, and and understanding what that is and what they are is key and fundamental to our society especially as i said before this is a capitalistic system that we operate and it will never change even if it collapses like it did before in 2008, 2009, it still hasn't changed. Nobody's changed it. We've kept the same model and the same system, and it will still operate for the rest of your life and the life beyond. So don't sit and argue with it. Run with it yeah. and actually see if you can make the best of it. That's what I would recommend to everybody out there. There's no point in being, if you want to be a socialist, build as much wealth as possible and give it all away to the people that need it. If that's the yeah. case but i tell you what when you build all that bloody wealth you'll no get away because <laughs> <laughs> no. you'll be like wait a minute it's all mine now because you've worked for it it's easy to talk about somebody else's wealth and give it away free gratis oh Elon musk why is he no giving it away oh jeff bezos why is he no giving it away but if it comes to your own well why are you no giving it away then oh, well oh, oh tumbleweed uh, and crickets. Uh, yeah. <laughs> tumbleweed and crickets now i could hear you know it's like nothing there's no response to that anymore 
It's like as soon as you mention about them giving it away, it's like, oh, I'm no, no, I'm on the bread line. It's like, oh well, let's look at that then. How how well on you? Oh, you got two cars. All right, you've got two cars then. You live in a house with a roof over your head, and it's the it's the house for your needs. And then it's like, oh no, well, it's like it's uh, there's an extra bedroom that I don't. Need. Well, so why you got a house with an extra bedroom? You're paying for that. You could sell that and downgrade, and you could give that house that, that or you can give that bedroom to somebody that needs it. Yeah, then it opens a can of worms. Yeah. See, they're all, they're all, all these neg say the naysayers and the neggies, the ones that sit on the sidelines and criticise while you're in the arena fighting it out. All these people, that's the people that are happy to give away somebody else's wealth and take from someone else, eat the rich, but they're no happy to do it themselves when it comes to themselves giving something away. Yeah. Oh, I can't afford it. Oh, I can't afford to live on that. I can't afford to give anything away. Well, let's take a look at your lifestyle and what you've got. And I bet you there's a lot of things in there. The nights out that you have, the times at the pub that you have, and all the opportunities that you can give away money and just forgo that, and you're not prepared to do it. That's what typically happens with people like that. They'll point I the finger at someone else, but there's 10 fingers pointing back at you. I could tell that, say, hit an air for you, Jim, but I know obviously you've probably come up against Isn't that. Isn't it hit an air, really? I'm no, not, but I mean, like, I'm not really bothered. Come up against but that, but it's, it, it resonates every single yeah. time, and the fact that, you know, there's people out there that are prepared to go, you know, these landlords are parasites and all the rest of it. I get it all the time on TikTok. And and the vilification and the name-calling and the spitting on you and the assaulting you and the swearing at you and, the you know, all these different things, it's like, give, bring it on. It's like you know, I've I've had worse. It's like you, you, and if you can if you can put up with that, and you can just you know, you didn't really put up with, it, you just ignore it. It's like you know, go back to your sad wee life then. You know, it's like you just stay in your poverty mindset. Now, I'm trying to I'm we're on this show trying to elevate people up and trying to take people to the next level and trying to show them ways that they could make more and produce more income yeah. and possible possibly increase their wealth so they don't have to work till they die. And yet you've got people that will come on and say things like that. And it's like, well, you just have to pity them, don't you? Yeah. But you're you're definitely correct in terms of obviously money and having a knowledge of how money works. And oh, I'm always correct. Yeah, and, but financial literacy and things, and like you say, that'll rub anybody, people up the wrong way. Yeah? I think anybody <laughs> that um, wants to um, have that level of knowledge has to do, obviously do even just the basic level of, of business studies. I mean, even myself, Jim, when, when I progressed within my role within our company, I went and done business management, and as part of that, it's, it's obviously you do accounts and it's, it's balance yeah. sheets and it's profit and loss and things. I am, and obviously that was at HN levels, but that, I mean, even at the, at the basic levels, that will be part of the curriculum because you need to have an understanding of that. So even if it is just a basic level of business study that you do to have that understanding for your own business, it's, it's really worth its weight in gold to have that knowledge. I am, obviously, like I said, prudent uh, money management and, and financial literacy and things are really fundamental pillars yeah. of anybody's journey for wealth creation, no matter what you're doing. If you've got Mark, a business, your own business, then that's something that you really need to take on board. Mark, now I know Mark Cooper. Uh, Mark says, until the schools teach about real life, we all yeah. we all waste years learning that lesson. Totally agree. I mean, I left school. Like, unless I mean, unless the schools yeah. teach real life, and that's what it's what it's about, and stop mollycoddling people and letting them understand what it's really like out there. And also, and also, I'm not saying give them a you know give them a, like a, 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 a mindset beating or anything like that. What I'm saying but, is the financial that. literacy. And the fact that you know this is how you do things, and this is how the world, the world works. works. This yeah. is what you should. This is how you should adapt it. Um, and by the way, I know you're. I know you're specialising to be a chemist or a pharmacist or something like that. But make sure you've got some sort of financial literacy in there, and um, so you understand yeah. when you do get out. Because there's a lot of people earning a lot, earning a lot of money, therefore paying a lot of taxes, which is what the the system wants you to do, because it's paying a lot of tax. But they don't know how to plan their future and, yeah. and build wealth. They don't know how to build wealth. They know how to make money, but they don't know how to build wealth, yeah. and they don't know they don't learn how to keep it. School really, obviously, the school system doesn't want to teach you how to do that. 
because therefore everybody would be wealthy. Therefore, no taxes would be getting paid because yeah. people would be building wealth without actually earning a lot and actually just living on what they need day to day rather than actually spending and going for broke every single time. And I mean yeah. things like I want that Gucci belt. I want that, you know, Prada handbag, you know, all these different things that people want as a result. It's not they, they would now learn what to what they need and actually live on what they need rather than what they want. Yeah, that's a key here. It's learning to live on what you need rather than learning to live on what you want. What you want costs you a hell of a lot more. Oh yeah, and that's what that's what will sacrifice your financial future. That's why you'll work till you die for that reason, because you're you're spending money on stuff that you want rather than what you need. Therefore, your financial future is at risk as a result of that. Yeah. Definitely. Let's let, let's move on and talk about wealth creation itself then and how it is a steady path um, through to financial freedom and independence and things that people strive for. And that's exactly what you said, Jim, at the beginning. It is a, it, it's not an overnight thing. Wealth creation is a gradual process and yeah. it does involve strategic planning and, and a long term perspective as well. There's so many people that, that enter into, we'll, we'll use property investment, obviously, because that's what we're talking about today, and think it's going to be an overnight thing. And, oh, I'll give it a couple of years and I'll be, I'll be, I'll be making lots of money, I'll have lots of passive income. And that's Takes not ages. how it works. Yeah. Takes ages to build wealth. Um, but once you get started and once you get on, that, on, on, the, on the journey, mm -hmm. um, it starts to compound. So it's just like anything. You know, it's, it's the one pence doubled up for 31 days. Yeah. It's like in the first, you know, first ten. So you go from you go from one pence to two pence, to four pence, to eight pence, to sixteen pence, to thirty-two pence, to sixty-four, oh, yeah. to one hundred twenty-eight. Am I boring you yet? One hundred twenty-eight <laughs> to two hundred fifty-six to five hundred and whatever it is. Um, uh, two hundred fifty-six times two, two five six times two. Uh, oh, it's five hundred and twelve. We're all on. We're all on uh, nine. Mm -hmm. We're on a, we're not on nine. We're on fifteen or something like that. We know. No, I think we're on. I think we're on fourteen. Uh, then multiply by two. We're on fifteen. So a thousand and twenty-four after fifteen years, right? So, so fifteen days, fifteen years. So you can easily get disillusioned after fifteen years and go, "Oh, this is terrible." But once you multiply that up and you get to to to, to thirty-one days, it's at it's at nine million or ten yeah. million after 31 days it's something like 11 million like that, but yeah. it's one pence doubled up for 31 days so it's easy to fall out of the fall out of the system at, at, at 15 or 20 and think this isn't working but when you learn to understand the the huge impact it will have in the wealth creation and the compounding later on it's like you set yourself free yeah. You understand where you're going. This is why I st this is why I talk about it to most people. It's like I always started with the journey, with the end result in mind. Mm -hmm. So begin with the end in mind is probably one of the most important thing. I'm trying to get my spreadsheet from my fixed asset register to tell people what I actually, um, how many years it took me to get my first thirty properties, as opposed to what I've just done now by Wednesday. <laughs> <laughs> that seems weird. Eh? Um, yeah, that seems yeah, really it's, weird. It's true, and obviously property investment offers. It does offer a reliable avenue for wealth creation, and that's due to obviously its potential for generating both the passive rental income and also capital appreciation over time. So, property investment does have those uh, benefits to it in terms of wealth creation. So you got your, you got your. Yeah, I'm just waiting on loading up. All right, okay. Um, so yeah, by acquiring income uh, generating from properties, you can create that stable cash flow. Uh, mm -hmm. And then that contributes ultimately to your, your financial security and independence, but it does take time. Yeah. So first 30 properties. Yep. Yeah. Eight years. See, there you go. Two, eight years to get my first 30 properties. And I've literally done it in eight months this year. Yeah. Now, I mean, people might be watching and thinking, well, maybe 30 of and then another 30, you know, maybe that's not the, the level they want to be at, and that's fine. But even on a smaller scale, it's still it's still it's still time oriented. Yeah, keep going. No, sorry, I thought you were going to say something. Yeah, so even on a, a smaller scale than obviously 30 or, or, or then and obviously then 60 and whatever, and further on to that is something that's maybe 
a wee bit more than most people want to do. Maybe people, and like, we, like we've said quite a lot, the majority of landlords only have one or possibly two properties. And that's fine. Yeah. And maybe they just have that to set them up for that wee bit extra for their pension. Um, they've maybe accidentally acquired a property for, for let, and that's fine. And they've got that as an extra income. And that's fine. And, but and, uh, people sometimes become accidental landlords and then get that kind of, okay, this, this provides additional income and want to build it up to there and maybe want five or six or a smaller mm -hmm. portfolio and that's fine but it still does take time to build that up into a lucrative passive income um, yeah, yeah a, lot, a lot of people won't realize that in the beginning i actually mm -hmm. rented yeah well i know that but i actually rented my house uh, in the beginning i didn't actually own a house in the beginning mm -hmm. i actually rented so i rented and started to build wealth like that because renting at the beginning for me was a lot less than owning at that time because owning was a fortune it was like interest rates were about 15 or 18 percent it was crazy and renting was a lot less and renting a house is or a flat at that time was um the renting's the least you'll the the most you'll ever pay because you don't pay for any repairs or anything yeah. to the boiler or anything like that or any anything that happens in terms of the roof repairs or anything Whereas a mortgage at that time is the least you'll ever pay because you pay the mortgage and you pay that. And some people will argue the fact that, you know, at that point in time, you will you will be accruing, you know, some sort of wealth. But I was still accruing wealth anyway because I was putting money aside and a portfolio investment with standard life. So I had a versatile investment plan. I also had an endowment which wasn't attached to a house anymore. Therefore, I continued to build wealth through that. And I used these two vehicles to actually put down as security to get a hundred percent lending to go and buy houses for buy to let because that was now an investment income i would have got 100 percent security for to go and invest in a, in a in a fly by night you know i've got a great idea let's start a business yeah. thing i would never have got 100 percent lending for that from a bank because that's not that's pie in the sky that's not even happened and it's not it's not material it's not fact yeah um, what I did was I used that and then I went to buy houses and I got a fund as a result of that because they knew if I cashed that policy in with its guaranteed income because it's guaranteed valued right now, that that guaranteed value would be security for them to make it an 80% loan to value. But the 100% lending to me still made the numbers work perfectly well. So people out there say about, you know, oh, you should own your house. It's like, no, there's different scenarios. If, if owning your house isn't the way forward, then you shouldn't own your house. Because owning your house is just a liability. Because mm -hmm. all you're doing with owning your house is actually just, um, it, well, for one thing, it's keeping you in the same place all the time. So you can't move or have any flexibility, especially if you've got a good business and, you, and your business needs you to move from place to place. And then you've got entry and exit costs of ownership, which is a huge amount of money. You could have taken that money and actually put it into an investment vehicle and got more houses and made more money. So you could rent and actually own houses and rent as well at the same time with these houses. Yeah. So there's a there's different models for different people in different circumstances that actually work very well. But I would argue as well as what Kiyosaki says is your house is a liability. It just costs you money all the time. It doesn't actually make any money. It just secures your place on the housing ladder. Yeah. And you get the increase in the value of the house over a period of time. But the only way you're ever going to release it is actually either you die or you go into a Same. home, you have to pay your medical bills. So you die, someone else gets it. You go into a home, the state gets it. Or you then finally sell and go and live and rent an accommodation. What like that? what I'm going to do. Yeah, that's what you've got planned, yeah. You move into rent accommodation once you finally sell and you release all that money you've paid off. You've all your all your houses really is some sort of liability, but it's also a savings plan, if that makes sense yeah. for the future. But it's only a savings plan if you if you if you decide to sell it finally, release all the money and go and rent. That's the mm -hmm. only reason it becomes a savings plan from then on. And everybody keeps going about it's like oh, renting is just like throwing money in the fire. No, it's no, uh -huh. it's not. It's not. It's not at all. Um, and then it's like oh, that money doesn't go back in that. Of course it does, because the landlord that owns your property actually goes and spends that money in the local economy, so it does go back in the system. Because I've heard that argument as well. Landlords just take out and it doesn't go anywhere else. Well, it does. It goes back into paying for joiners, for for plumbers, uh, for electricians, for letting agents, for 
estate agents, for solicitors, for you know, for for people that live in you know carpet carpet fitters and all these different things, painters and decorators. It goes back in to pay all their salaries. And where do you think they work? They're local businesses that work in the community. So that trickle down effect of that money that you're making as a result, as opposed to the bank making the money, by the way. So who's taking all the money out of the system? It's the bank that's taken out of the system. The landlord's keeping it and putting it back into the system by using all these trades as a result. So your local landlord is far superior to the bank. And they're leveraging it and using the bank's money to make the money and put it all back in. So there's 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 a huge benefit to that. And, you know, people can argue and argue and argue about it. But the reality is landlords have a vital contribution to, to, to contribute towards the local economy and also the local housing system as it is the now. Imagine just 250 to 300,000 properties in, in, in Scotland disappearing overnight. Into home ownership, by the way. Be great for home ownership. Yeah. But what about the people that need to rent? They'll be homeless overnight. The There'll be nowhere for them to rent. Yeah, the homeless last long enough in Scotland, so um, that would not be um, a good outcome. But yeah, but I'm going to talk actually. Just I'm just going to come on to rental income and reinvestment and the benefits of that as well, Jim. So, but um, yeah, in terms of wealth creation and things, and the, it's obviously referred to, it's referred to quite a lot about investors diversifying their portfolio and things as well. I mean. Jim, I know what your portfolio is like, and would you recommend to someone who's looking to build a big portfolio to look to try and do too many different things? Or, I mean, diversifying your portfolio. I, I know biggest, I don't like it either. It is the <laughs> biggest myth ever. <laughs> know. And do you know who came up with diversify your portfolio? Somebody's there Property on the trainers. Yeah. Property <laughs> trainers that want to sell you another course to convince you that you might be able to do HMO or you might be able to do commercial or you might be able to do <laughs> you might be able to do flips and refurbs and all the rest of it. They want to diversify your income because they just want you they just want you to buy another course that they're selling. That's why they want you to diversify. It's like if you've got something that works very well and it's timeless and it'll never go out of fashion and people will always need it. Why on earth are you needing to di diversify your income? There's no point to that. All you're doing is all you're doing is all you're doing is diversifying your time and taking your time away from generating the true wealth that you could get in the first place. It's actually costing you money to diversify. Yeah. In my opinion. Yeah, I would agree with you. Because um, I've seen people try to di diversify too much and like you say obviously getting caught up on maybe thinking hmos are going to be more lucrative when they've already got success in renting two three uh, bedroom flats and houses just stick to that then it works um because yeah, because you remember I, you people go oh i don't want to really deal in your low value flats and it's like you know why i buy low value property and low value flats and I do them up extremely well inside and refurb them at a high standard because i'll get really good tenants but if it comes to it it is an easy exit strategy. Yeah. I am not trying to sell a six hundred thousand pound house. Yeah. I'm trying to sell something that's about seventy or eighty grand, which mm -hmm. is affordable to a huge amount of people, including other investors. Other investors or first time buyers. Or, yeah. And you can offload these quite easily and have an exit strategy quite easily, especially with the cost of living and people want to buy more affordable accommodation. I yeah. saw the writing on the wall years ago about this 30 years ago that's why i started that strategy mm -hmm. because i saw this coming and the fact that what happens as soon as you jet more money into the system all it does is inflation just eats it up and therefore you're back to the same level of living you had in the first place but you're actually paying more for it yeah that's all that happens i mean selling up for you would be obviously it's a last resort and that would be a that would only be if everything went to the wall really to be fair but in the meantime rental income and 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 rental income as a source of a uh, continual cash flow is, is really important yeah and it is, it is a really an attractive part of property investment uh, but as you inquire uh, acquire properties and and put tenants in place and generate this steady cash flow it's really important and you've already touched on that a few times jim because i know it's a big part of what you do is reinvesting into your stock and looking at potential uh, acquisitions which we're, we're in the process of doing but uh, reinvestment is really important for you and your business model, but also your tenants and things as well. Yeah, of course, every yeah. single time. So the cash that I generate every single time on my portfolio is to reinvest back in the business. It's yeah. no for me to go on a great holiday. 
or anything like that. It's 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 just for me to reinvest back in the business and keep the business building and wealth. But also, when I'm reinvesting back in the business, what I mean is I'm getting all these repairs and improvements done over a period of time. Therefore, yeah. the stock is automatically increasing in wealth as a result of me reinvesting in, in, in the right areas. Yeah. Now, examples of that was when I first started, double glazing was a luxury. And, and then what happened was the tax man actually changed it and says, look, we don't expect you to put single single glazing and single glazing because it was a capital it was a capital improvement it was classed as under tax law. So therefore you weren't allowed to you weren't allowed an instant deduction in it. But in a few years after me starting, they actually brought in the law and they changed it and said, We don't expect you to put single glaze back in if you change them. We'll give you the deduction for double glazing. And I went, Yeehaw. And I, I just went and it's, replaced it's every single window I could. Yeah. Every it's single window better, was man. Every single house was replaced with double glazing because it was a tax deduction. Uh, I was quite happy to do that because at that time I was earning enough in my day-to-day job as a financial controller, and that's what we were living on and reinvesting still. So we managed to reinvest still off of my, my wages. And, you know, Elaine was working at that time as well, and she took her redundancy, and that we ran, reinvested her redundancy in, yeah. in, in, in the business as well when we first started. So these were all opportunities we took to reinvest every single time and build wealth. So, you know, I, it, was, it was literally I had a spreadsheet on a, on a written paper that told me, you know, in 40 years time, this is where I would be with the income I was coming in. And this is how many properties I needed to buy every year, year on year. There was I, I didn't have spreadsheets at that time. I just had something on a, on a bit of paper I'd actually written out by hand and actually just multiplied it all up. Yeah, because yeah, that's how I first started. So that's that's, uh, you know, I didn't I didn't do any spreadsheets. Yeah. Or that. Did Excel not exist? <laughs> I don't. I don't think. I think it was Lotus One, Two, Three, and it wasn't yeah. fantastic. You know, it was. It, there were free spreadsheets at the time. They were trying yeah. to make their name for themselves. So it was Lotus that we actually used. Yeah. And and when I first started in industry, I never knew that much about using uh, formulas and all the rest of it. It was yeah. only when I started to go to college and stuff that I started to learn about that. And then that. And then I became more knowledgeable and more knowledgeable and more knowledgeable. And then I started saying, OK, I could put it on the spreadsheet now. But I, I was determined to actually walk about and actually look at that every now and again and think that's my that's my that's my 40 year plan. Yeah, that's what that's what I intend to do. That's what I intend to follow every single time. So I stuck to that 40 year plan. But walking about with that and say, like you say, in your pocket and referring back to it, it's quite a good um, it's quite a good driver as well. If you think about this and, and just to kind of re uh, re-emphasize to yourself this is what i'm this is what i'm doing this is where i'm where i want to be so yeah. I, suppose, I suppose at the time for you it was quite good but uh, but yeah reinvesting in stock and and what you've got is very important now i know people may think well that's fine and uh, maybe like using yourself as an example jim you've got the, the the ability to reinvest all the time like that but maybe some people do want to or have to uh, take some out um and pay their share at a certain amount but you could do that but as long as you make sure you still have money to reinvest and keep your stuff i don't i don't necessarily think you should take anything out i think you should just have because because if you're running if you're running your own if you're running your own uh, property business i mean property is viewed as a as as an investment it's not viewed as an an income it's very rare it's only the raw the the rule of ramsey so if you look up legislation for ramsey um ramsey actually says that your property business could only be teached uh, as a business if you're self-managing and mm-hmm. if you're working in the business and you're doing the repairs and improvements, and that's when yeah. you can change it to an LLP over a period of time from your ownership, own ownership to an LLP to a limited company, and you can mm-hmm. actually alleviate all your capital gains. So at this point in time, I don't qualify for Ramsey, you know, mm-hmm. the, the legislation. So therefore, I can't alleviate my capital gains position. And that's okay with me. Um, but so they they view as property investment as, as investment income, and they tax it under a different schedule as opposed to your PYE, which is Schedule E, and uh, and other other schedules, which is um, um, Schedule uh, D, Case One and Case Two, are uh, self-employed people and retailers and that. So they 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 view these differently in terms of how they how they do it. Holiday lets is Schedule D, Case Six, I think. And that's all coming back to me. <laughs> schedule D, thing. Case Six, which is a different rules as well. And yeah. um, so these are all different things by the laid down by the HMRC. So you've got to understand this. See see what I mean about understanding finance. Yeah, and understanding, and once you get the, you know, the benefit of me being an accountant by trade previously, and the property investment, and then being an estate agent, being a letting agent, and being all the rest of it, is actually it's all married up. It's all symbiotic relationship between all of them, and they're all complementary skills which are needed in that in that in this field. 
Um, and that's where everybody else gains as a result of it, because I've got all these skills and this is what we teach here. And we, yeah. we, we, we talk about it all the time. And, and, and people will come on just to criticize. And it's like, God, do you not realize what's happening here? You've got somebody teaching you how to be a millionaire. It's like, yeah. it's, 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 utter, it's crazy. It's absolutely crazy. Some teaching you how to be a millionaire. I, but, and, and that's what it is. Everybody could be a millionaire. I can guarantee you everybody could be a millionaire. Oh, no, I can't be a millionaire. That's exactly why you'll never be a millionaire. Because yeah. you're telling yourself you'll never be a millionaire. And your mindset goes, oh, just give up. Just give up. You know, when you get up every morning, you just didn't think about anything. Your mind doesn't become active. It doesn't actually, it becomes reactive. It doesn't become proactive. It becomes, you know, inward and negative. And, and it doesn't see any opportunities as they arrive. They don't see anything yeah. appear in front of them. I mean, the 30 properties I'm buying, that only came about because I heard on the grapevine that possibly this landlord might sell and I didn't ask anybody else. I knew where I could get a copy of his number because I lost touch with him because I knew him from years ago because he yeah. started at the same time as me. And I knew where I can get in touch with him. So I nipped round to the place that his number was on the billboard and I phoned up and says, you think they're selling? And he went, yeah, yeah kind of remember. selling. Remember, now, so I would never have gone and done that. Yeah. If but I hadn't been remember. receptive and I had just been to 20 properties, Richard, and I just said the 20 properties and I've bought 20 properties already, I would have just switched off and thought, well, it doesn't matter. I don't need any more. Yeah. But remember, you had heard about so many of them. And then through another line of communication, I had heard about some and I'd said, and you went, oh, that's the same person. And that's how it come about. But there was ones that you hadn't heard of as well. And that's where it all come together. And then I, then I sat down with that person and then I went through his scenario and I went, oh, my God, you're you're at, you're at the shit yeah, off your back. Yeah. You're yeah. literally going to lose everything at this point in time. Yeah. What is the number you need to exit? And we went through that in detail. He was very yeah. honest with me. We yeah. went through in that detail the number he needs to exit. And I said, OK, that's the number I'm thinking. Maybe 50 grand more than that because that will pay for your legal fees and everything. So you'll get out of your shirt off your back. And so I was I was fine with that. Uh, and then, then, then I looked at the the dynamics, and I went away and found out what the finance was on that from Kessa, uh, yeah. and then I went and found out what the legal costs and everything like that as well to to buy and the implications of that, and it it racked up to about sixty or sixty five thousand in legal costs and arrangement fees, um, as well and securities to to do that, and then I then I ran by them. Look, I own some properties outright. Um, in its entirety, there's no there's no encumbrant debt, there's no securities on them. Would you take that as security, and I could get 100% funding from you from for this portfolio? Well, only if this portfolio values a certain amount. So I then went to the surveyor, and I got the surveyor on board, and he went, yeah, that that could work. Yeah, they, that would be these normal numbers. Now I'm on a stage, and I kind of knew that anyway. Yeah. Uh, and then because I, I all the Zupla values have been looked up as well, and then once I put all that together, I went, yeah. But at the time, I said, yeah, that number will work. And then I worked through it all, and I went, yeah, it's like, let's go. Let's go for it. And then it was a long, drawn-out process from the lender because they were very, very nervous overall about um, one. They're done. They were, right, okay, let's get valuations done. So they went, no, no, no need to do that. We've done automatic valuations. <laughs> so the automatic valuations came through, and I went, that's brilliant because we can just do this pretty quick, and we'll just get on wet. And then lo and behold, uh, they went, Oh, we've kind of changed their mind now. After about blooming two months, we've now changed their mind. We want you to do manual valuation. So we're wanting 12 of them or 10 of them with manual value. All right, okay, I'll get the 10 of them. So we've got the 10 of them with the manual valuations. And then the 10 of them came back and they compared against their automatic valuations. And I think they went, well, oh, we wait have, a minute. Yeah. Wait a minute. Our automatic valuations were way out as opposed to the manual valuations from the surveyor. So what about the rest of them? <laughs> but this was another two months in. What about the rest of them? And I'm like, you're having a laugh. You want me to do evaluations for the, the other 27? Yes. So I had to get them to do the other 27. And it was getting access to all these 27 properties. In the meantime, another two months are passing. And so as you can see how it's all passing in terms of the time. And then the next minute, we get to October or November, and then they say to me, uh, oh, these valuations you got six months ago. It's like they're now out. We'll have to get them done again. You're, oh, you're kidding. And you've got to pay for them, by the way. Sorry, I've got to pay another 3,900 quid to get these valuations done again. I said, so is this going to happen with the next, with the 27? Because you're going to do the same thing. So I put a massive complaint and upheld it because they were going to increase the rate as well yeah. from 5.6 to 6.89. Hold it. 
It's not my fault these have gone out of, you know, these valuations have gone. You have delayed. And the great thing is, this is why I about getting the right broker on board. Yeah. The brilliant thing. This is why I would endorse Kessa every single time. Kessa gave me a whole timeline of what happened. And I didn't need to go back and rectify that. He gave me all the timeline and I put it in a formal complaint and I proved beyond a shadow of a doubt that the critical path to this process was three months it could have been done earlier yeah. because of their failings to take and taking too long for their their underwriters to actually work out whether this was a good risk or not. It took three months more and that's why this all happened and they upheld that complaint. They kept the rate at the same rate that they had agreed in the first place because I said if it's going to 6.89 I'm not doing this deal. There's no way this is going to happen. And then, like you're saying, Jim, about having a good broker, if Kessler hadn't had that information to pass on to you for you to argue your, your case, you would have maybe either had to back if, out or had no, a higher rate. No, most people would have, most people have rolled over and says, I can't do this deal anymore. High, yeah. Whereas I went, nope, I'm not going to go through it. I'm going to go around it. <laughs> See, when you get an obstacle, you don't need to go straight through the obstacle. You can go over it. You can go under it. You can go around it. You could even remove it. You don't need to go head on with it. Mm -hmm. That's one of the keys of tenacity. Tenacity, discipline. This is what things like running and triathlons and climbing mountains teaches you. It's like it is never over till it's over. Till you're lying there and you're on your deathbed, that's when it's yeah. over. And even when that's over, it's probably never over. <laughs> <laughs> it depends. won't be for me anyway. Put it it that depends way. what you've got set up. That's what I was going to say. Yeah, it won't be for me because I'm, I'm leaving a legacy and yeah. that will always live after me anyway and I'll always be remembered for that very reason. That's probably the ultimate aim of everybody, to be remembered for something that's beneficial yeah, to society. Legacy, yeah. yeah. To, to, you know, this is what we're here for. Ultimately, we're here for procreation. This is what humans are designed yeah. and geared for. That's your instinct. That's what you're always here for. But ultimately, as well, you're here to leave some sort of legacy. Nobody wants to just be forgotten by the next, the next, uh, the next, um, next generation. Uh, generation, and then the generations to come. People want to be remembered. Hence the reason why people stick their plaques on stuff and fund. You know, um, it's a typical example. <laughs> that guy was a slave trader, and it's like, let's take down their statue. Um, and yeah. well, what about the extension they built on the hospital? It's got their name on it as well. Should we knock that down? No, no, don't knock that down. It's like, but wait a minute, we're hauling down their statue. <laughs> <laughs> so she would not be taking the hospital extension down as well. No, no, leave that. That's okay. Yeah, but it's got the name yeah, on it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's just a by the way. <laughs> I know. <laughs> all I know these people out there. Um, but yeah, definitely. But, obviously, legacy is a big part of it and things as well. But I just, I just, I just want to finish off uh, on the rental and uh, rental income and cash flow side of things. We did see, obviously, about uh, reinvesting, and we really need to emphasize that to maintain. Um, and have effective property management and yeah. ensuring that your rental properties are well maintained and tenants are looked after and they're re reliable pairs and, and good tenants that are looking after the property and that will ultimately result in your consistent rental cash flow. Yeah. For anybody, Andrew, Andrew's on there, Andrew Smith, actually. If he's still there, he's maybe off, he's maybe got bored of me talking all the time, <laughs> um, which I've got to live with me for the rest of my life, so hey ho. <laughs> It's like, at least you just could all leave and switch off. Um, uh, he says, actually, great stuff. I've only got five at the moment, and that's great. However, yeah, that's I would good, love yeah. more. Um, Andrew, it's about maintaining the five just now yeah. and building wealth over a period of time, reinvesting that money you make on the five, putting it back into the property. Do not spend it. Reinvest it. Build the property wealth as a result of that. And then what to do is leverage that and use that as leverage to get more property. Yeah, that's what you're doing. That's what you do every single time. But you're not leveraging yourself to the point where it's uncontrollable and you've actually gone to a case where you just can't afford to do it anymore. If interest rates move up and if, if, if occupancy rates drop, if rents drop or rent get controlled and anything like that, that's the sort of thing. So, Andrew, if you're in Fife or in the Fife area, around about the Fife area, you should be messaging us direct with your details and come along to the property chart. Yeah. That Richard has every month. On a Thursday, Richard, yeah, Thursday. last Thursday yeah, of every Thursday. single month, Richard has a property chart in Fife. Just get together. It's not a, this is my well, lecture on what I've done. It's more an yeah. experience sort of process. This is the situation I'm in right now. What would everybody else be doing about this? It's more a, 
and it's more an, a networking event where people can just talk to other people with no it's not a it's no pitch event that's what we call it a no pitch yeah. event you know kevin wright does that as well no pitch events there's no upsell there's no sales there's no anything like that nobody's trying to sell in there anything it's everybody getting in a room and talking about property and talking yeah. about wealth creation and talking about how we can do it how they can get started in it what journey they're on right now how many properties they've got can they build can they do anything else should they exit should they it's it's literally people in a room talking to each other and getting the right responses other than actually going into social media which is like a flipping long drawn out process with everybody else getting their opinion involved in what you're doing and you're just like i just really want a private chat with somebody and yeah. knows what they're doing and knows what they're talking about maybe somebody that's a wee bit further forward than me or maybe an experienced letting agent has actually got a real good knowledge about the local area and understands the whole dynamics about how to put this together and how to source property for me and so i don't need to do it because i want to go back to being a surgeon or i want yeah. to go back to being a solicitor because it pays more than actually trying to do all that and messing about i'd rather just get somebody to source it and save me money and actually i'll pay them to do it um that's what you do yeah it's good to sit with people um that are on different um different journey parts of their journey and are looking for advice maybe for different reasons and being able to have a uh, conversations where you could lead them to the right people that they need to speak to depending on what yeah they're looking for, whether it's financial or mortgage or whatever kind of advice that they're looking for or whether it's saying or... where in Fife. So where in Fife it's uh, Mark Inch? It's Mark Inch, yeah. Fig tree. It's the fig tree, yeah. That used to be Plus, the old barn. Hotel. So but yeah, you when... need you need to anybody on TikTok, message us your contact details direct on TikTok or anybody on social and media. Message event. us yeah. direct your contact details. Richard will send you an invite out with the full details about where it is, what it is, and when it is. That's the key. So do that, definitely. You just do my email address, John. Okay, so rental yeah. income, consistent source of cash flow. Um, definitely, I would say that. Um, uh, I'm just going to say, if you just tell people my, my direct email address, it's probably better. Yeah, okay. Well, richard.cook at fiveproperties.co.uk. Yeah, I just wanted you to say it because you've got tech talk there. That's all. Okay, uh, so oh, rental yeah. income, attractive prospect, uh, a profit investment. Yeah. You know, I, we, we put this article together actually, and this is the basic foundation for it. Acquiring properties to, um, and, you know, leasing them to tenants, investor generating steady cash flows. Keep reinvesting that money. Your property business is your side hustle to your mainstream income, which is generally your job. Yeah. Work on your job day to day, work on what you're doing, be the best in your job you can be, have your side hustle of your property build it up to a point where you can actually go i tell you what i can actually leave i am not a big fan of saying to people leave and start doing property flips that's the great pretender paul mcfadden who does that you know let's shout him out for what he is he's just a great pretender he just want to sell you a course and that's it in a nutshell and other people as well the leads the Samuel leads people and all the rest of it. You know, all these people, the hive together and a collective organization, and that's all they're really wanting to do. They're just trying to get you side hustles. They're just trying to they're just trying to sell you courses. They're trying to diversify so they can sell you something else on an upsell for the next course that you're on. Anybody that's been on the course knows about the upsells. It's just intense until you sign up before the end of the course. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and tell me otherwise, because it's not. And I know that because I was taught that system by the people that te it teach it to all these people. And I don't operate that system at all. And I'm not interested in that system at all because I've got nothing to gain from it. Um, we just we just talk about it all the time because this is this is all about preparing the next generation of my lot, you know, for taking over a portfolio and running with that as well. Uh, definitely. I've been on these scam courses again. <laughs> Somebody's saying, <laughs> it's like, well, you know, uh, you get well, some, listen, some of them are pretty good. You know, some of them are pretty good. Some of them are actually have good content in them, but you, you you know straight away when the upsell comes, it's like, oh, there's something wrong here. I think the um, courses and things that when you go in, there's always something to be learned and there's always something you could take away. It's just don't get drawn in by the upsell and the courses and I've definitely, people, people uh, but, but we are, we are, we are weak minded, a lot of people. Now you become really strong-minded when you when you read a lot of books and the right the right type of books. You become really strong-minded. You don't give in. You can see it coming a mile away as a result of that. And therefore, but you also see the opportunity because you've read the right books. So you see, you know when the opportunity is right. You know when it's not right. 
as a result of reading the right books. And that is, you know, think and grow rich. That is, you know, Tony Robbins' financial strategies. Um, that is um, seven, seven Habits of Highly Successful People, Stephen Covey. Um, that is Richard Branson finding my virginity, losing my virginity and, you know, um, whatever his virginity is at this point in time. Mm -hmm. You know, these are the sort of things that you read and you learn from people more successful. Diary of a CEO as well, you know, learning from these people. Diary of a CEO and learning from people far more successful in, in their field, the principles and the basic fundamentals are exactly the same in every single person. They're just using a different product, a different service in terms of what they're doing. But I'm a big fan of you have your full-time job, you have your side hustle, and you grow that business at the same time. You stick to your full-time job till there comes a tipping point that you think, okay, I can now retire or this is the exit strategy I want. And then you plan your exit strategy from there in advance. Um, and you don't leap straight away and think, I could just leave. And the next minute, the market takes a tumble and you're stuck because now the employment market's gone sky high and you're no longer employed. Yeah. And now you're too old. Nobody <laughs> wants you. <laughs> or that's what that's what people think. Now you're too old. I can walk out tomorrow and say to any employer out there in any field possible, give me, you know, let me operate your business, let me advise on your business, and I'll increase your your wealth and also your bottom line um, drastically, you know, like a, like a J curve, um, exponentially. I'll, I'll, I'll move it up exponentially. And I'm 57, and I'll, I'll, I'll be able to do that no bother and get a, get a job or get a consultancy or anything like that because it's the knowledge and expertise that you've gained over the years. Most people come out of school, and then this is another, we might actually talk about this in a major show later on, most people come out of school and they think that is the end of their learning. Yeah. And then they run their cell down in a mainstream dead end job for the rest of their days and they learn nothing else after that. And then when they get to 57 and 60 year old or 50 year old and somebody says, you know, I'll have to make you redundant. They go, I'm thrown on the scrap heap now. And it's like, who's going to take me now? You're exactly right. Because you've not learned anything. You've just sat on your laurels for the rest, for the next, for the last 30 years. Yeah. And not even learned anything extra. Not even improve your skills and, sh and and your skill set. You've not done anything to improve that. Why do you think anybody would want you then? And in your job, all you've done is you've basically taken. Next. <laughs> next. 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 And that's all you've done in your job for the last 30 years. And then you go, I've got 30 years experience. No, you've not got 30 years experience. You've got one year's experience of doing that for 30 years. <laughs> that's all you've got. You've got yeah, one year's yeah. experience of doing that for 30 years. That's why you get people like Diageo and that, and I'll call them out as well, paying you an absolute fortune to come and work at Diageo on a line because... They don't want you to leave. And by the fact that they pay you a fortune, then they get you locked into a cycle where you've taken loads of credit out, you've got a big, huge flash car, you're living in a big, huge flash house, and they know damn fine that you can no longer leave that job yeah. because there's no other job in that vicinity that will pay the salary that they're paying you for working on the lines. Yeah. That's how they get you. And if you're happy with that, you're happy with that. But yeah, don't go into that thinking... Don't go into that thinking, because I've seen a lot of younger people come into this business, you know, into the industry, and then they've left for places like that and thought, yes, yeah, more money. And it's like, oh, my God. But unless you've got career progression, unless you prepare to learn more, you will never move up beyond that. Yeah. You need, you need to be prepared to be like, well, that's where you're going to stay. Yeah, Kaizen. Continuous self-improvement. You know, that's what that's what they're saying on here on TikTok. Kaizen. I've always believed in that. Yeah, was Kaizen kind of was an American yeah, who actually helped Kaizen. rebuild Japan. Kaizen was the American that re helped rebuild Japan after they dropped the bomb on them. Yeah. And then they built them into a superpower. Yeah, <laughs> um, it's like, well, hey, let's blow you up and then we'll build you into a superpower. We'll even tell you how to do it. And it was the guy, the guy was Kaizen. Um, and yeah. that's who did it. And it's, a, it's remarkable. Kaizen is continuous self-improvement every single time. And it's these 1% all the time as well. So you need to do that. That's what it's all about. It's not sitting on your laurels. It's not expecting the world to owe you a living. It's actually going out and doing something about it. And I hate to say this, but it's like what Norman Tebbit used to say, get out on your bike and do something about it. Yeah. You know, if you want, if you want to improve your life, get on your bike. 
and do something about it then. Not the greatest role model for most people because it was Conservative Party, but he's, but he's but they're absolutely you know that it's you know I could have said it was someone else and you, people would be more receptive to that. So think about that. If I'd said it myself and I hadn't mentioned it was Norman Tebbit that said that, for some people listening in, would you have thought about it in a different way? Would you have actually reacted to that in a different way? Possibly, yeah, probably would have. Yeah, and it's and it's all about your preconceived ideas and your pre preconceived mindset about, you know, oh, I don't like that person, so I'm not going to listen to them. Listen to they're telling you how to make millions. I'll listen to them all day long. I mean, you know, Dan Pina is a classic, and I spoke to Ian this morning about it, and I spoke to you about it as well. Dan Pina is rip another hole in you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's what he'll do. But the reality is, I want to get about Dan Pina for a wee while. And he's doing a one-day workshop down in, down in London. Yeah. And, I thought, and I've emailed him and says, how can I get on this workshop? Because I just want to see what Dan Pina is actually like. And we've all seen him on social media going, what the fuck? And <laughs> arguing with people yeah. in the in the crowd and just going, what do you know? And that's all the rest of it. Get this fuck. You know, go forth and multiply and all the rest of it. You've seen him do it. But it's like, I just want to get around Dan Pina for the day to just see what Dan Pina is really like. What does a billionaire know that I don't know? Because I'm not a billionaire. So there's a huge difference here. What does he know that I don't know? And the cynical person will say he knows how to shaft people. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> but that, but that's what the cynical person does. Yeah, that's yeah. their, that's their, that's their, um, Mindset. that's their classic example of, you know, that's why I'm not listening to this person, or that's why I'm going to stay broke for the rest of my life. Uh, some says, who's Dan Peanut? <laughs> no, Dan Peanut. Peanut. So P N A. So Dan P N A Dan Pina, um, uh, that's the one. So look him up, Dan Pina. He's oh. he's brutal. I've but I do that. think I, I do think there's a, there's there's something to learn from Dan Pina for definitely for me there. Yeah, it might be just how not to treat people. <laughs> it might be as simple <laughs> as that. <laughs> but Richard goes, thank God for that. Go and see Dan Pina. <laughs> yeah, go to the I was going to finish up today, Jim, and just have a wee chat about capital appreciation. And people some mm. like look at that as unlocking long term wealth and, and property investment does obviously offer the potential for a capital appreciation. Right? And that's obviously where the, the property value increases over time. And the appreciation can be attributed to various factors. And that's obviously the location of the property, the infrastructure, the build type, what the market demands are and things as well. And if capital appreciation is your long term goal then obviously you need to really research proper areas and things as well. But yeah, you, you mentioned there when you were speaking to, I can't remember the guy's name that you referred to on TikTok there, who's got five properties, but investing in the property and increasing its value and then unlocking that and reinvesting it to then obviously progress your, um, your, your vital it portfolio from what it is to something better. So that's yeah. probably, that's probably, and I know that's a, a strategy that you've obviously implemented, Jim. Capital appreciation yeah, yeah. and people, Obviously, there's people that sell up to get that money out. Then you really need to think about capital gains and things as well. Yeah. Have you, uh, you're always going to pay capital gains. People yeah. go, oh, I'm not going to do that because I'm going to have to pay capital gains. Who cares? You're, you're not going to avoid You're that. going to have to pay capital gains yeah. anyway. The great, You know what I always used to get told by the, my peers was, Jim, if you're paying more tax, you're earning more money. Mm -hmm. What are you bothered about? You've got to pay the piper regardless. So you're just going to stay in poverty for the rest of your life just because you didn't want to pay more tax. Yeah, pay tax yeah. Really? That's a broke mentality. Now, you could be more tax efficient and you could be structured more yeah. tax efficient in terms of what you're doing. That's and that's fun. what I do. I've got intercompanies and intercompany loans and also intercompanies trading, uh, which makes you more tax efficient and moving one from the other. You still pay the full amount of tax somewhere, somehow, but it's it's it, it, you end up with more money in your hand, if that makes sense, the way you do it. Mm -hmm. So you're still paying a full amount of tax, but your company's paying all the tax and it's not you paying all the tax. Yeah, so you're personal. still getting nailed for it. So all these people that go, oh, you don't pay any tax being a billionaire. You it's do. like, yeah, you do. Your companies pay the tax regardless whether you like it or not. But you in your hand can work out how to be more tax efficient. So you actually get more money in your hand to, to live on, to, to do what you want to do when you want to do it. That's the key here. So marginally, you're still paying the same amount of tax more than likely, uh, unless you're doing intercompanies and you're in a tax haven that's a huge different scenario yeah. tax havens and um, which are monaco and stuff like that 
maybe do a show on that as well. Um, in the future, <laughs> I'll have to go and live in Monaco for a wee while <laughs> just, to, just to do a show. Research, tax yeah. deductible, just go and live in it. Monaco. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so now inspiration inspired for success actually says Kiyosaki doesn't pay any tax. Yes, he does. You just don't, he just doesn't admit it because he's just want to sell your course. Because then you go, oh well, how do you know pay any tax and pay for these course? And then you find out halfway through his course, once you've paid for it, that he actually does pay tax, but he doesn't personally say tax. It's a play on words. Yeah. Trust he me. Because he, he could stand and say, I don't yes. pay tax personally, doesn't I, he? Listen, I don't pay tax. I could say that. But, but I do just... pay tax. It's just another way. And Trump, Trump uh, don't pay tax either. That's no true either. Trump does pay tax. It's just that he pays it in a different way. Yeah. His companies pay it. He doesn't pay it. But he works it in a way so it's tax efficient for him not to pay tax. So, yes, he can get away with saying he doesn't pay tax. But in actual fact, all these companies pay tax. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, no, that's that, that's a uh, that is obviously a play on words, but technically that's what they can say. But yeah, obviously, like capital gains and things. They've all got really... they've all got something to sell you. That's really what yeah. it comes down to. Yeah, but capital gains tax and things is something you really need to obviously be aware of, especially if you're thinking about capital appreciation yeah. and releasing equity and all the rest of it. Um. Mm. So yeah, I think today, just to kind of finalise, obviously, money, wealth creation, property investment. Um, and they are all interconnected elements and they do pave the way for people's financial freedom and independence and, and things. And, and the wealth creation thing is something that takes time, as we've demonstrated today. And it really does involve prudent money management and strategic investment planning. And investments can generate both rental income and capital appreciation, as we've said, but uh, also really it's important to build a robust investment portfolio uh, and property in order to set yourself up for the future. And and if you're looking to set up like you like your plan, Jim, yeah. legacy and something that you want to leave for generations to come, you really need to have proper planning and um, building that robust and uh, portfolio to withstand. It's, it's whatever level of income you want to earn up to the point the the wealth and income that I've got, I can teach you. Yeah. And, and I kind of think that'll include 99% of the population, um, I would say, because yeah. I'm in the 1% um, of the wealthiest in Britain. Um, so so I kind of think that's, that's so I could teach people to get up to that point because I've done it myself, so I can teach other people to do it. That's the only way, that's the only way you could work. If you look at the other person and you say to them, have you got what I want? This is another thing my mentors taught me. Have you got what I want? And if the answer is you've got what I want, Therefore, I'm going to listen to you. Yeah. And this is often where I used to tongue in cheek, you know, years and years ago, when people used to say, I'll teach you how to invest money and all the rest of it. And I went, well, I'll tell you what, you write down your net worth and I'll write down my net worth. And if your net worth is bigger than mine, I'll, I'll listen, listen to, to you. you. Yeah. yeah, and you would never get anybody coming back to you. <laughs> nobody, would, nobody would come back to me and say, it's like, oh, right, okay, oh, well, they're just, all right, okay, thanks then, bye. <laughs> <laughs> it's yeah. like that was the end. when you get somebody to pin their colours to them the, 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 yeah the absolutely company. right okay let's finish off here because yeah. i've got a i've got a property tour to do no um, that's fine i was just i was going to finish saying obviously you do obviously understand yourself jim the potential that property investment holds and like you say you do that things like this and really encourage individuals to embark on their own lucrative journey so hopefully what we yeah. talk talk about on this show and this in particular today in reference to property and um, buy to let investment has helped people we do the uh, the weekly the, the monthly chat groups. People could jump into that. Jim gave you the details earlier. Come to me direct. My email is richard.cook at fiveproperties.co.uk. And uh, and I'll leave it there unless you're adding anything, Jim. Yeah, perfect. Uh, so, you know, I've, I've seen somebody on TikTok saying, do you need consultants and advisors? We are always looking for people who will add value to our business model. Yeah. If you think you can add value to our business model, then the answer to that is we're always looking for you then. Yeah. That's what it comes down to every single time and we'll leave it at that that's us for today thank you so Brilliant. much for the show Richard. thank you very much for the the content it'd be worth actually putting that article up um yeah, and, well, a good article. Yeah. Um, and i kind of think sometimes we don't actually put all these articles up but it's maybe it's maybe worth it for people it would uh, it would understand it and then they'll get a chance and then you can share it on the channels and let let everybody else read what we've what we've what we've written effectively yeah. uh, in here and discuss 
Yeah, because that was quite a good one uh, for people to, to read through it as well. So that's great. And we'll be back next week, 12.30 as usual.